Good evening. I'm the Jackie Dorrance Curator for Fashion Design, Helen Jean. Thank you for joining us this evening as we celebrate the newly formed Jeffrey Bean Archive at Phoenix Art Museum. We have an exciting evening planned and a lot of important friends to thank for making all of this possible. Starting with our hosts for the evening, the Arizona Costume Institute. Thank you, ACI, for your enthusiastic support to establish and grow this archive. Tonight, we're going to learn a little bit about Jeffrey Bean. We're going to look at some amazing examples from the archive and hear insider stories from a choreographer and a dancer that collaborated with Jeffrey Bean on fashion ballet mashups that rocked the fashion world in the mid-1990s. But before we dive in, let's hear a few words from ACI President Kathy May. Good evening, and thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I am honored to welcome each of you to Jeffrey Bean, a duet of fashion and movement, the first virtual fundraiser of Arizona Costume Institute and Phoenix Art Museum. This evening, we will celebrate the designer of Jeffrey Bean, and the establishment of the Jeffrey Bean Archive at Phoenix Art Museum. Tonight, you will enjoy a rare preview of the world premiere of a short film and so much more. Before we begin, I want to thank each of you who worked so diligently and were so dedicated to making this evening happen, especially amidst the challenges of the global pandemic. From our generous donors to our ACI members, collectors, filmmakers, curators, and beyond, you mean the world to us. Thank you for attending tonight, and thank you for supporting Arizona Costume Institute. And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Timothy Rogers, the Sybil Harrington Director and CEO of Phoenix Art Museum. Good evening. I'm Tim Rogers, the Sybil Harrington Director and CEO at the Phoenix Art Museum. We're so very, very happy to have you with us tonight. This is going to be a special event, and we're really looking forward to it. Before we get into the event, I do want to thank some people, and I also want to give you a few facts and figures about our very important costume collection. First, I want to thank all of the members of the museum who support us in all things that we do. But specifically, I'd like to thank ACI. ACI is a support group that helps us with all things fashion at the Phoenix Art Museum. And without their help, we really would not be able to do the things that we do. I also want to give a particular thank you to Patsy Tarr, who has given us the Jeffrey Bean Archive Collection. We're very fortunate to have such an incredibly significant collection here at the Phoenix Art Museum, and we're going to be highlighting it in a number of ways, of course, including tonight. And we're going to be seeing some really remarkable images related to the Jeffrey Bean collection. Finally, I want to thank the entire community because it is the community that has created this collection. We have over 8,000 objects in the collection related to fashion. That's an incredible number because we only have 20,000 objects in the entire collection. So it goes to show how important fashion is to the Phoenix Art Museum. But more than that, it shows how incredibly important the community is in creating the collection that is so important to the Phoenix Art Museum. So I thank all of you for being here. I thank you for joining us. I look forward to meeting all of you in person. So please enjoy this evening, but with the caveat that very soon we'll be doing things where we get to meet in person. Thank you. Hello, and thank you all for joining us tonight. I am Corinne Adams, one of the four co-chairs of our amazing Jeffrey Bean virtual event. I have been an ACI member for six years, and you will meet all four of the Jeffrey Bean Virtual Event Committee members tonight. We wish we could all be in person, but know you'll understand our commitment to safety engaging. We are so grateful for all of you that could support us this evening and attend the live stream event. 
ACI has committed to support the conservation and acquisition of the Phoenix Art Museum Jeffrey Bean archive over the next four years. And we're excited to join Helen Jean, who is live in studio this evening. So please enjoy your evening. Thank you, Perrine. Jeffrey Bean was a trailblazing American fashion designer. He's most widely known for men's shirts and neckties, but he's most celebrated for his work in women's evening wear. His clever use of stretch fabrics, the way he curved seams wrapping around the body, and the placement of color and texture evoked a sense of movement throughout his garments. It is this concept of movements that has inspired our evening tonight. This archive holds important examples of Jeffrey Bean's work, including gifts from Ellen Katz, Saks Fifth Avenue, and many others. In fact, one of the earliest pieces gifted to the museum's fashion design collection in 1968 was a Jeffrey Bean. A photo of that dress appears in our closing credits tonight, so make sure to look at it at the end of our program. It has sequins and ostrich feathers. It's absolutely beautiful. But the majority of this archive is the wardrobe of one person, and that is a very exciting and rare situation. It allows us to consider not only the designer's perspective, but also the experience of the collector who loved and wore these pieces, and that is valuable insight. We are so grateful to Patsy Tarr for gifting her wardrobe to the museum. Patsy is the co-founder of Twice Magazine and Twice Arts Foundation that supports and celebrates the dance community in New York. She collected Jeffrey Bean evening wear over three decades, often wearing them to the ballet. Over the past seven months, we have been working with local production company Manly Films on a short film that explores this archive. To help tell our story, I reached out to Jeffrey Bean's longtime model and dancer, Deanna McBrarity. Deanna joined Bean in the early 90s and worked with the designer for over a decade. She and Patsy agreed to sit down and share their experiences wearing, modeling, and dancing in these garments. I am so excited to share this film with you all, and I can't wait any longer. Let's roll the film. This is a work of art, right? Who designs clothes like this? You never see this. Even to imagine this, you'll never see this again. Never again. I was living in New York. It was some salesman at Bergdorf Goodman. He directed me to Bean, and I tried on a few things. Jeffrey Bean wrapped up New York's preview of the spring fashions on a high note, but then the U.S. designer is considered to be almost above reproach. I just loved the outfit, and they were really comfortable, so I bought them. I was 18 years old. I was hoping to get asked into New York City Ballet because that is what I trained for since the age of 13. And then the moment came where they said Jeffrey Bean came looking for dancers and I wasn't there and I thought, oh no, I can't miss this. I love Jeffrey Bean. So I went down to his studio and I said, I heard that you were looking for dancers. I didn't get a chance to be there. And would you mind if I were to be considered? And the next day I got the word that Jeffrey Bean wanted me to be one of the four dancers he was gonna work with. Eventually I came to the attention of the Bean organization because they, you know, this one crazy person kept buying his clothes. So they invited me to a fashion show. They told me that if I, you know, really wore all the bean stuff that I'd been buying, they'd put me in the front row. After a while, I just stopped buying other clothing to wear in the evening, and I only bought bean. At the day of the exhibit, when we were all in jumpers, especially made for us by Jeffrey Bean, dancing around the photographs in the studio, his assistant came up to me and took me aside and said, Jeffrey Bean has decided that he wants you to continue to model for him. When you look at dance a lot, the thing that you really want to know is what the choreographer was thinking. You have this burning 
desire to meet the choreographer. And it was like, it started to feel that way. It was Jeffrey Bean. I felt like I had to get to know the man who was making these clothes. If you put flexible clothing on a, a dancer, they'll show you how it moves. And he just gave me that freedom to have his pieces speak. And that's what they did. I went in to talk to him. And I said, look, here I am. Here's my life. This is what I do every day. I need some clothes. Can you help? And he thought about it for a while. And he said, you know, you really are the perfect candidate for jumpsuits. You can dress them up. You can dress them down. Any shoes you want to wear, I swear to you, it solved every problem I had for many decades. As a dancer, I would look at it and first feel a lot of freedom because it's pants. This went everywhere. This was black tie, this was every day. I wore it constantly. I knew not be afraid of which angle the photographer is getting. So you can run around, sit down, stand up. There's plenty of room in that jumpsuit to move around. I could do high kicks, I could do leaps. It looks like a collar, but it's not really a collar. It's just one of the greatest designs ever. It looked so casual a little bit of red that's on the hip. That just makes the whole thing so sophisticated. Each outfit told its own story, and I felt like I could hear that voice, and I would put it on, and I would tell its story. You know, it's black jersey with some white striping. That's not very exciting, but when it's combined with satin, and it's cut the way he cut it, that was, I think, his great trick, was that he cut his fabrics in triangles. That way they fit the body perfectly. And then when they all had to be sewn together, it just made it so much more interesting. Everything had its own personality. This was his solution for what to put over a jumpsuit. Little nothing jacket, you know, if you were warm, you had a more substantial one, if you got a little colder, and then if you were really cold, he made you a coat. I mean, is this the most magnificent thing you've ever seen? <laughs> Straight sequins, round sequins, embroidered flowers, different colors. This is incredible. This is a garment that it, it's maybe a yard of material, but he kept piling on. <laughs> and there is such articulation. His work is so unique. Proportions from any other designer look terrible on top of Bean. He tried to define the body. And he did that in lots of different ways. So you always looked alluring in some way, even if it was a very conservative garment. The whole design, it's, it's creating its own choreography on the female body. He always began with fabric. I mean, it was very important to him to have beautifully made fabrics. All this great texture differential and then the, the cutting so that it fits your body perfectly. The detail in these dresses is incredible. The different proportions above the waist, the way the skirt gathers, and the way the underskirt was engineered. He loved these dresses. I loved them too. I mean, these dresses are fabulous dresses. It brought me immense pleasure. I mean, really immense pleasure. And I just could never get over the clothes. I, I would just look at the clothes. To me, they were just magnificent little works of art. It is so thrilling to think that such a large collection of Jeffrey Bean's outfits could be on display. Very few people get to see the details up close. It's sort of like a performance is going to be put on <laughs> for the eye. so happy that that's how this has all ended. Now going to be seen by more people. And somehow something happened in between his making that dress and the client wearing the dress. Something happened where you just became a better version of yourself in his clothes. I, I don't even know how to articulate this, except that I was the best I ever was in his clothes.
Aren't those garments spectacular? This archive truly is a national treasure, and it's the result of a decade of friendship with the museum. In 2008, Phoenix Art Museum board member Ellen Katz introduced Patsy Tarr to Danita Sewell, our former curator of fashion design. And soon after, the museum presented the exhibition Jeffrey Bean Trapeze. In 2019, Patsy gifted the majority of her Jeffrey Bean wardrobe to our fashion design collection. We are so grateful to Ellen and Danita for their foresight in forming this important friendship and ushering this wardrobe to the museum for us all to appreciate. I joined the museum in late 2019 and have the immense pleasure of researching and sharing this extraordinary collection with you all. I want to send a special thank you to our Bean benefactors who were early supporters and believed in this project from the beginning. We wouldn't be here without your ongoing generosity and commitment to the museum's success in these challenging times. Now, I was able to catch up with Patsy the other day, and I asked if she would please sit down with me and look at a few highlights from the archive. I even had a special surprise to share with her. Let's join in on our conversation where I, where Patsy is sharing some delightful insights about a favorite mohair coat. He and I had a long running conversation about mohair. Somewhere in the collection you have now in, at Phoenix, there is a little bolero made of this identical material. And his feeling was that if I wore a jumpsuit with the bolero and then the coat on top of it, he insisted I would be as warm as if I were wearing a fur coat. And we had this long running conversation for years about this. And I kept complaining that I was so cold because I mean, I was, I was only warm on top. <laughs> so then he said, I'm gonna make you a coat and you're gonna wear the coat on top of the bolero on top of the jumpsuit. It's gonna be better than the fur coat. So it was, I mean, I used to die of the heat once I had all of it on. He considered this one of his most important, most fabulous dresses. He called the vest his tree of life. He based this particular dress on miniatures he, I, he had seen in a museum in Dresden. And if you go back and look at those porcelain miniatures, that's exact, this is sort of what the shepherdesses looked like in that kind of work. When you, when you look at the bodice and the way that he's called out the shape of this bodice, yeah. and this is with a silk gazar. Yeah. And then the yoke and the sleeves are out of a Pima cotton. Mm -hmm. So here, you know, we've got Bean hearkening back to his tailoring days and menswear and pulling some cues from that, but really following these lines that we see on those Dresden figurines mm -hmm. where this would have been the corseted bodice and this would have been a separate skirt. And it's such a wonderful spongy silk gazar, yeah. and it really holds its shape. I mean, there's no, there's just the the very tiniest um, a, a petticoat underneath, mm -hmm. very very thin. It's the fabric itself. It's very buoyant. You can see around this neckline, it's top stitched with a gold metallic thread. Yeah. Again, just a very fine note for the wearer yeah. or for those that get in close enough to get to experience and appreciate. True. It. Show everyone, if you can, the the in, inside hem, because there's yes. a petticoat that has a, an incredible hem. <laughs> so it has a horse hair and yes. a hem that's then covered with a purple lace. Yes, isn't that just fabulous? <laughs> well, 1988. 1988, okay, 1988, not, there were no other clothes in the marketplace that looked like this. This was just so original. I mean, I never saw anything, to this minute, I've never seen another dress that came close. This is why he was a master. I mean, he the imagination to put all this together, this incredible embroidery, it, it just, you know, I, I always thought of, thought of it as a matador jacket. I'm not sure if that's what he was thinking, but that's how I thought of it. The amount uh, and the variety of different stitches that are all yeah. uh, combined here, it's really up close. The, the surface is just alive with so many different textures. Yeah. French knots and satin stitches, and there's not only is there embroidery floss, but there's ribbons and beads yes. and sequins. Yes. 
And of just, course, the way it's all designed. I mean, just, you know, the way it's so painterly, you know, it, 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 there's so many colors and different proportions and things. This was hanging on a hanger in a store. This was not a special commission, you know, in Paris. He really brought high fashion to the masses. He was, I think, the equal of a Parisian couturier. And yet he was an American and he made his clothes available through department stores. I think when people wore bean, or when I, certainly when I wore bean, you began to feel very powerful because you didn't need all this other stuff. You just didn't have to have it. You just, you alone were enough. <laughs> you wearing the clothes, that's all that was required. Well, Patsy, yeah. the Arizona Costume Institute was so very inspired by this wonderful collection that you've donated to the museum that in honor of establishing this archive, they have pledged to continue growing the archive for the next five years. Wonderful. And I wanted to share with you the very first purchase that the Arizona Costume Institute has made to join the new Jeffrey Bean Archive. Very nice, very nice. Oh my gosh, this is so great. Look, we'll, I'm gonna have to put on my eyeglasses, all right? Oh, I love this. This is by Joel Eula. Oh, how fabulous. I am so thrilled for you. That is a real find because Bean loved him and he had all his illustrations in his atelier. It's fabulous. Congratulations. Hi, I'm Laura Madden. I'm an ACI member and I'm so happy to be a co-chair of this virtual Jeffrey Bean event. I am really a huge fan of Jeffrey Bean and I love his use of black and white and especially the polka dot. Wasn't that so great to see Helen unveil our acquisition? Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Don't forget, check out our raffle and auction pages for some great prizes. And now we'll go back to Helen for more of the show. Thank you, Laura. In the mid-1990s, Jeffrey Bean decided to break from the traditional format of the fashion runway show and chose instead to partner with some of New York City's finest choreographers and dancers to create runway ballets, which highlighted the wide range of motion possible in his evening wear. I am so delighted to introduce Doug Verone. Doug has worked in ballet, theater, opera, fashion, and film in venues around the world. Here, Doug shares with us the backstory to creating the choreography for Jeffrey Bean's very first runway ballet for his winter 1995 collection. Hey, Ellen, thanks so much for asking me to be part of this. Uh, my time with uh, Jeffrey Bean in the early 90s um, was thrilling and I um, it was a, a great challenge for myself uh, as an artist to be part of uh, a form that I was really nascent in. So it was a great learning process for me uh, as a dance maker to um, be um, interwoven into the, uh, the couture uh, fashion world for a short period of time. Um, unbeknownst to me, Mr. Bean was a huge fan of my work. Uh, he came to see my company uh, at the Joyce Theater uh, in New York City. And um, I think what he loved about the work was not just the choreography, but also the environments that we would build uh, through uh, our lighting design, uh, through any type of, uh, type of set work that we were playing with. Uh, particularly, um, I think he was drawn to how uh, dance lighting or side light as we call it, um, uh, in the dance world uh, really heightens uh, bodies in space. And I think he was really drawn to finding ways to doing that uh, uh, within his own uh, runway shows. So I got a call uh, the next day uh, to meet with him about uh, creating uh, a runway show that fully integrated movement and, uh, and models, um, uh, something that felt uh, different and unique. Uh, for the form. And um, he wanted it to be a completely uh, fully integrated uh, presentation. Uh, he talked about uh, 
building uh, atmosphere, uh, a darkness, a mystery to the work. And uh, we agreed that uh, we would work with 16 dancers and 16 models. So uh, I held an audition for uh, the original 16 dancers that uh, we worked with and created a two week rehearsal process to build a 25 minute long work uh, that uh, would eventually integrate 16 models as well. Uh, and of course, you know, the models we barely saw until right before the, uh, the show, but it was part of their, um, I will say they're part of their contract and their agreement that they needed to be um, uh, part of a rehearsal process towards the end uh, of our process to, leading up into the show. So, um, you know, I think that was very different for models. Usually they get jobs uh, one right after the other in, on, in runway week, they'll run from one job to the next. And we were asking for a commitment, uh, a commitment to be with us on uh, several nights before the show, the morning of the show, and also to be moving um, and to present themselves in different ways than they ever had. Uh, I was uh, asking them to um, learn specific gestures and movements as they walked. It wasn't just about um, going to the front of the stage and coming back, but they were completely and fully integrated into um, the dance experience. Um, so uh, we created very simple moves for them, gave each movement a name so um, they could easily remember. And then of course, uh, try to navigate moving them through the space uh, in the correct time against the correct score uh, with the dancers. Um, each dancer and model had, uh, I, I believe three different designs. So there were a total of 90 designs over the course of 25 minutes. And how that progression unfolded uh, was in great uh, dialogue with uh, Mr. Bean and also his assistant at the time, uh, Albert Abez, who went on to have an amazing career with Lanvin. And, um, you know, I think we all agreed that there needed to be a progression of um, how these designs spilled out onto the stage. Um, certainly for me as a choreographic artist, I. I wanted to make sure that the choreography against the score also had its progression. So we weren't just building um, a runway show to um, share design works, but we were building uh, a dance that actually had artistic integrity to it. And I think people were really startled by that when we showed it. It, it, it really was a, it was a beautiful uh, 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 dance production that incorporated uh, uh, these beautiful couture designs in, a, in an utterly unique way. Now, we were able to find footage of two of these runway ballets, and I invited both Doug Verone and Deanna McBrarity to watch the shows together and share their memories of these collaborations. Let's listen in as they reminisce on these spectacular performances. Hi, Deanna. <laughs> Hi, Doug. How great. I'm excited to see your work. Oh my gosh, again, right? Here we it's go again, yes. After many, many years. You know, uh, the beginning of this, uh, of this uh, particular uh, ballet, which was the first one, began with a, a very specific image. Um, I really remember Mr. Bean talking about um, an image that he had seen in the New York Times uh, that uh, was from uh, the dialogue of the Carmelites. It was an opera by Poulenc from the Met Opera. Very specific, uh, uh, all of these um, nuns that are face down. And he wanted to begin uh, this particular uh, runway show with that image. Uh, and uh, 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 that was the starting point of it all. Started off very, very slowly. Those coats were so full, like, and with your movement that you gave, Doug, it's it's playful but prayerful at the same time. Maybe it's that mystery. You can see the mix of what the dancers are doing. These are two models coming downstage now. Just the simplicity of gesture against the largesse of what the dancers were doing. Um, I jokingly called it um, air traffic control a little bit because it was. Um, <laughs> 
very much like moving moving parts in space, um, making sure that um, people were in the right place at the right time. And um, woe us if if um, anyone took a little bit extra time at center stage when they weren't supposed to. <laughs> Timing is everything. You can really see how the side light is, uh, is uh, really kind of capturing um, the nuance of, of both of the material and of, of, uh, and of the designs themselves. And all those flashes that you're seeing are the photographers that there wasn't a strobe as part of this. It had to be a highly new concept for the press to have to take all that photography with stage lighting. Deanna, I was mentioning uh, as, a, uh, as a city ballet artist, uh, you know what photo shoots are like. It's about bringing as much light up as possible. So I, I know that the, uh, that the press really had a field day with this. Yes. They, they did. And, and of course, he was known to be original and radical. So anything unexpected is what was expected. Yes. And I remember the, rehearsing for this. Um, they were long days. Uh, we, were, we started at 10 in the morning and went until 8 at night uh, over a two week period. It was a lot of material to create in a short span of time. You can really see the, uh, the combination of the dancers against the, against the models right now. And we would always bring him on stage at the end. Beautiful. For being as, as shy as he seemed, it was definitely, definitely deserved to. Yes, uh, getting him to center stage was a tough, um, a tough call. <laughs> <laughs> This one, I remember having a, a bit of a black and white theme. Yes. It, was, it had more light. This one was called uh, American Primitive, I believe. He, he sent out an entire folder of maybe some still photos and as an invitation and a poem attached because again, he liked to have the multiple collaboration. And he was very, very clear with this one, uh, uh, very different than the first one, uh, maybe because our collaboration was uh, in its second, uh, its second uh, period, but um, he was um, uh, very, very inspired by uh, American Gothic, by uh, Puritanicalism. He referenced Martha Graham quite a bit in in, in our conversations, um, and uh, he said he wanted nothing pensive, nothing unclear. He wanted joyous and proud and innocent, um, and he wanted it to be bright and clean. Um, you know, so as you can see, the stage is all white, the backdrop was white, and I think we even had um, set in, a set in the back there, you can see it actually, um, uh, uh, several pieces of fabric that were both um, uh, transparent and opaque, uh, dan uh, dancers and models could go behind them, uh, and they shifted their, um, they shifted their uh, visual uh, throughout the course of the, of the ballet themselves. I remember the score um, that we chose for um, American Primitive uh, was uh, kind of a mashup of, um, I want to call them American favorites. It was um, Fanfare for the Common Man, and we used a little bit of Rodeo. Um, you know, it was a, it really, we kind of really drew on the Americana theme, but we ended with this rousing um, section from a, a Michael Nyman uh, symphony. And um, it, I don't know if you remember it or not, but it, 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 it was beautifully bombastic and also kind of uh, emotional towards the end. And I, I remember saying to Mr. Bean, I, if you let me use this music, I guarantee people will be in tears and they will be on, they'll be on their feet. And by the end, by the time you came out in that last um, boring, in that last design, mm -hmm. people were already on their feet. Um, and it was just kind of a beautiful, um, a beautiful uh, way to embrace uh, the entire uh, piece before the end. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful and powerful, as they all were, all the shows. It's interesting when um, uh, I fir first met uh, 
uh, Mr. Bean, and then I spoke with uh, Albert afterwards, and he said, now, you know who Mr. Bean is, right? And I was like, you know, I, I, you know, he's as honest as I can be. I, you know, I wore gray flannel from the late 70s, and that was how I would go out at night. <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> But you know, the world of couture was not my my oeuvre, so to speak. So I, I really had to do a lot of research and uh, uh, and a lot of research on Mr. Bean and what made his design so spectacular. You know, the scene, right. the cut, all of it was extraordinary craftsmanship. Um, and you know, those are things that I, I learned a great deal about, and also tried to figure out a way to um, incorporate and embrace within the within the runway shows. When I first met him, like he had come to New York uh, to School of American Ballet to pick some dancers for this first exhibit, and I was out of town. And then he uh, was going to choose by Polaroid, and I found out about this when I arrived back in town, which was only about two days later. I said, "What? Jeffrey Bean was here, and like you said, you knew about gray flannel, right?" Well, I right. had <laughs> gone to the dance and outlets as a child, and so I had seen all the Jeffrey Bean clothes in the outlets. Right. And I knew his name, but I was not familiar with Couture. And so I said, well, I can't miss this opportunity. What's his address? 37 West 57th, I'm going. And so I marched all the way over to 57th Street and I um, rang the doorbell and Joyce, his secretary had answered and remember Joyce, I love her. Yeah, and so she said, well, let's take your Polaroid. And I think you're, get, you're fine, honey. I think you're great. And then that was it. And I was part of that. And it was a continued collaboration. But I, you know, was influenced from that day forward by Jeffrey Bean in many ways. Uh, the wonderful Mr. Bean. It was wonderful to hear those insights from Doug and Deanna. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. My name is Kelly Sucre and I'm one of the Jeffrey Bean virtual event co-chairs. It's impossible for me to pick just one favorite Jeffrey Bean piece or influence, but I really do love his elegant evening gowns. They are so elegant and timeless and I just love the way they're cut and the way that they move. I wanted to remind everyone to remember to bid on items in our auction and to enter the raffle. There's so many great items available and all proceeds help ACI support Phoenix Art Museum's fashion design department. I also wanted to make a special announcement about a contest that we're holding in connection with the event. We have reached out to students at local high schools and colleges here and asked them to create a design or an illustration based on their favorite Jeffrey Bean garment. The, we had a tremendous turnout and the students are so, so talented. I was personally floored by the level of talent out there and think you will be too. So please go to the ACI website and vote on your favorite. I also wanted to extend a special thank you again to the Bean Benefactors who helped make this event possible this evening. We truly couldn't do it without you. Lastly, I wanted to do a quick reminder um, that all ACI members in attendance this evening will be automatically entered into a drawing to win this beautiful Jeffrey Bean coffee table book. And additionally, Everyone that makes a purchase uh, during tonight's event through the auction or raffle or makes a donation will be automatically entered into a drawing for a special docent led tour of an upcoming fashion exhibit. It's truly not something to be missed. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Kelly. In the early 90s, Deanna McBrarity was invited to model and dance for Jeffrey Bean. For that very first event, she wore a black wool crepe jumpsuit trimmed in white. This past October of 2020, she put on that very same jumpsuit and created a dance homage in honor of her 12 years working with Jeffrey Bean. Now I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy this beautiful performance to close out our evening. It's always a pleasure to talk about my modeling days with Jeffrey Bean and to honor him in any manner. So I am Deanna McBrady, a former dancer with the New York City Ballet and also a former model with Jeffrey Bean for 12 years. I would appreciate to show you all a clip that I recently filmed.
dancing in a jumpsuit that he had originally and personally made for me for one of our first exhibits together. You can see me dancing here barefoot and I chose that intentionally. Mr. Bean always had me model in point shoes or bare feet and that was intentional on his part because he felt any sort of shoe might date his clothing. He made very classic clothing and, and timeless and he wanted it to stay that way. And I, I think dance allowed him to, to show that elegance and, and flexibility with his clothes and bare feet allowed it to stay timeless, which he, he was a radical. And I think everything he did was intentional. He liked having artists to interpret his visions. I mean, he never told me what to do. He always just said, be yourself, do your art form. So what I'm doing here is a little bit of interpretive dance, which when he would give me a piece to put on, I would think, how does this make me feel? And what Feelings does it evoke that I could express through dance. It allowed me to give his clothing expression. And um, I think that's what he liked about the partnership is, is that we could really blend and, and show off um, each other's work. Uh, he, was, he was innovative in that way. He, that's why he started out with runway ballets where he would have dancers dancing in his clothing among models who were walking in the clothing because of course his his clothes look good whether you were walking posing or dancing I remember the first time I put on a Jeffrey Bean and I walked in it and I posed in it and I danced in it and the stretch and the versatility of the fabrics just allowed us as dancers to express our movements while giving expression to his designs. Hi everybody, I'm Ruby Farias. I am an ACI member and a co-chair to the Joffrey Bean virtual event. I'm so excited to be part of this fabulous community filled with fashion conscious leaders. We have been working many, many months on bringing this exciting event to you, and we truly hope that you've enjoyed it. Thank you so much for joining us. I am so happy to announce that we're going to be extending our raffle and silent auction until 8 o'clock tonight, so you've got time to make some more bids, buy some more raffle tickets. We greatly appreciate you, and good luck. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the end of our celebration. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. This has been such a special project to work on, and again, it would not be possible without the dedication, creativity, and generosity of many people. Thank you to everyone that contributed. If you enjoyed this evening's program, please consider becoming a Phoenix Art Museum and Costume Institute member. Your support makes all of this possible. Thank you to Patsy Tarr, Doug Verone, and Deanna McBrarity for all the time that you contributed to make our special programming for this evening. Before you sign off, make sure to check out the closing credits for student submissions and some behind the scene images of the archive. Thank you for joining us tonight. Good night. <laughs>